morning. First of all, I would, I would like to apologize for the title. When I was when I was working on this PowerPoint, I was last week. I was rather upset about what is currently going on, the policy and political debates. So, but still, I kept the title. And here, I think it is important to say that it is my title. It is not VVOB's title. Uh, so, for those who plan to Twitter on this, um, please do not Twitter that this is a VOB, VVOB statement. This is my statement. But at the same time, I would like to echo what uh, Kathleen said. And this is what will my last slide be it's about advocacy. I really think that it is time that we try to see, try to discover, try to look what, what opportunities and possibilities we can uh, come up with in order to advocate for some of the things that have been said. Okay, my, the, it wouldn't come as a surprise for those who know me that my position and, and from my personal work and from the work we do with all my colleagues in the Center for Diversity and Learning is about equity and social inequality in education. And needless to say that social inequality and unequal outcomes in education are tenacious problems. And although I'm very critical on PISA to a large extent for validity reasons and for the fact that uh, many of the tests they use, in my view, are highly invalid, I think what PISA did was they showed, they strongly showed that uh, inequality in our educational systems across the world and specifically in Flanders is a very tenacious problem. And I think that's why we have to be, uh, that's why we uh, have to thank PISA uh, for. Now, in addressing that problem of social inequality in education, we seem to opt for what is the most obvious choice, which is just put them in a language bath, or for Dutch, the taalbot, um, uh, what I translate into an exclusive L2 submersion model, L2 here standing for Dutch. And this is what we've done since, and uh, there has been made reference to the, f uh, the first minute minister in, in since 2000, 2002, where the policy was language, 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 but actually what was meant was Dutch, 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 Dutch. So here I also, I, I want to advocate for the fact that we have to carefully and critically think when we use concepts like language. We are talking about language as a problem. No, there is not a language problem. It's a much more complex uh, challenge we are facing here and not just language because language, which is a generative term, is used here just to focus on Dutch, on one specific variety. So, but for the, for the last 10, 15 years in most European policies to overcome, I'm smaller than you, Kathleen. <laughs> Interesting. Good. Okay, that's better. Uh, for the last 10 or 15 years in most European policies to overcome that so-called problem, language is seen as the key, as the lever, and I would say the condition for school success. And that's why we opt for language uh, language policies. Schools are obliged to have language policies. Uh, schools are even being evaluated for having language policies, which is fine, which is perfect. But actually, when we talk about language policies in schools, we are talking about policies with regard to Dutch as a second language. There's nothing on multilingualism. There's nothing on multilingualism. And we come up with remedial teaching programs, with pull-out classes, and I'll come back to that in a second. And we know that there is no empirical evidence for pull-out classes, but still, we stick to that. We have summer schools, schools kids are no longer migrant, kids are no longer uh, allowed to, to, to participate in summer schools just for playing and having fun. No, 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 it has a very specific purpose. It is to acquire Dutch. Again. Sorry for that. I think it, it, I, I think I'm, I'm, it's because I'm, I'm getting older that I'm getting less patient. I'm more more impatient. But we do not acknowledge. We ban and we suppress the use of all, most of migrant pupils' languages and their repertoires at school and in the classroom and even on the playground. And this is based on four assumptions. And people who've heard me before talking, they know these assumptions. I'm not going to dig uh, deeply into these. But these are deeply, deeply rooted assumptions. And we do have a lot of empirical evidence. And for those who are interested, we've written on it in English and in, uh, in, in Dutch, uh, where we crit critically reflect on the basis of research we've done over the last 10, 15 years um, just to deconstruct these uh, assumptions. So we know that these views of an L2 submersion model are superseded. 
And that sole focus on, on, on Dutch or on language is a too narrow focus. We know from international research that an exclusive L2 submotion is uh, less uh, effective than assumed. The inequality gap seems to increase. When I look at a Flemish data, 2000 PISA data compared with 2015 PISA data, the gap isn't closing. Although we already have for 15 years these L2 submersion models and Dutch language policies um, uh, across schools. But on top of that, we know that from social linguistic research that already unraveled that the complex dynamics of our youngsters' multilingual practices and how they construct and share knowledge has, be, has, has been very well um, uh, presented by uh, uh, Professor Hugh. But also from sociology research, we know that it's not just about language when we want to explain the mechanisms of social inequality. We know that it all has that it also has to do with to what extent there is a positive or negative teachability culture, whether there is a positive or negative whether there is what is the, the futility culture. Our tracking systems are strongly having impact. But also from educational research, we know that leadership is key in order for children, for children to be successful. We know that powerful learning environments are important. We know that having high expectations, co-teaching, feedback, we all know that, that these also contribute for kids being successful. Bespo besides the fact that language, of course, is an instrument we use to deconstruct, to construct, to unravel and to transfer knowledge. And we know that an exclusive L2 submersion model is in contradiction what uh, we know about SLA over the last 20 years. We know that language learning takes place in the context where that specific language repertoire is being used. And yet we say, no, before you enter, before you can particip participate in school, we will test you and then we will put you separate and then afterwards you can participate in school. This is not, from a human rights perspective, unjust, but also from an SLA perspective, it doesn't make any sense. But still, we do that. We know what the negative impact of monolingual perceptions and beliefs uh, are. This is also well documented. But averse to all this empirical evidence, all the data we've gathered over 140, was it, Kathleen, over 140 years, averse to all that, that empirical evidence, we see that the policy plans and the actions also of the new government build on an even stronger monolingual and deficit paradigm. Of course, we know that links with the revival to a monolingual ideology and a sub-state nation building, and we know that it's, it, it strongly links to very traditional and market-driven education models. And we know that, um, as I said, PISA also here is in more negative sense, highly influential in policy making. We see language, when I use the word language, the other word that pops up is problem. Language problem. These two words are one cognate. We think from a, def uh, uh, a deficit paradigm and we ignore the multilingual uh, and uh, the multilingual repertoires and the knowledge that children bring into our school systems. And we then think that in order to address that language problem, that introducing a uniform language test and putting kids in a separate classroom will solve the problem. These are pull-out classes or maybe pushing out classes. In the same time, when I listened last week, when I listened to the, 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 the discourses on, on, on Twitter, I saw that people make major mistakes but, uh, by confusing immersion and pull-out classes. Colleagues saying, yeah, but there is a lot of empirical evidence for immersion, so it makes sense to introduce such a language test and, and put these kids in separate classrooms. Immersion is something completely different than pull-out classes. But, and we, we see in the document so far that multilingualism is completely absent in the policy documents in Flanders. And that we know from research that it increases and per, uh, perpetuates uh, inequality. So what is actually what we see here is that strengthening of in trying to solve the problem of social inequality in education, the answer, the solution seems to lie in segregation. Let put them, let's put them apart at least for a year. That's a very odd option. So I think it is time to act from two different perspectives. One is the human rights perspective, and I'm not going to read you through the, the, the linguistic rights, but this is not new. 
There are all these, the, we already have these human rights since the 60s and before. So I think these human, that human rights frame is a very important frame to take as a starting point. But at the same time, I also think we have to look at things from an equity and social equality perspective. And here I'd like to share with you, I know it's, it, it's very brief and, 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 and it, 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 it's much more complex and, 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 and than, than the way I'm going to present it here. But just to, to give us at least an, a bit of an idea of three concepts. One is multilingualism, language and knowledge, and that strongly builds on what Kathleen has said. Multilingualism. Multilingualism is a cover term. We use it for all kinds of things. And maybe we should get rid of the term multilingualism. I think we have to be more nuanced in the way we, 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 we try to express the things we want to talk about. But at least languages, language repertoires, the languages I, I, I use I, in a functional way, the languages every, everybody uses in a functional way, and do have an identity perspective. And I think it is important that we reflect in our educational systems how we recognize value and share these. But it also has that functional and rational perspective. As Kathleen already showed very clearly, it is an instrument, it are instruments uh, for learning and um, for, for schooling. So I think it is important when we reflect on multilingualism in our educational context that we at least look at it from these, uh, at least from the, these two uh, perspectives. When we talk about language, we often tend to reduce languages to compartmentalized units. And this is something which we had, and that, that why it was interesting that the question when we, when, what was the, the, the name of the program, uh, Vivox? When we did the Vivox um, exercise, that there was that question of, what when I'm raised bilingual? It says something about, and this is no critique at all, but it says about something that we are really stuck in that, that first idea of that languages are compartmentalized units. And of course, each of these languages have their functionalities. But at the same time, we have to look at languages as has already been said, as translanguaging. The fact that we switch between codes, the, the fact that we use these re different repertoires and the third thing I'd like to add here from an equity perspective is that the language repertoires that people bring in in, their, in the school systems is not just the fact that they bring in other languages than the language of schooling, but that they bring in repertoires which are highly, uh, to a large extent, also, also socially determined. Depending on your social class you live in, in your you raise up with a certain repertoire, which often doesn't match, depending on your social background, without, which sometimes doesn't match with the repertoire which you use to construct and to transfer knowledge. Okay, I have to go fast, five minutes. I knew that I had too many slides. <laughs> knowledge, we know that there is something like universal knowledge. We know that knowledge is also culturally de uh, determined, but we also know that uh, knowledge is socially determined. This is something we, uh, we often uh, tend to forget. We know also that there are different systems of uh, knowledge transfer. It's not just having that knowledge which can be different and which a child or which we bring in in our educational systems, but the systems to construct, to deconstruct, to transfer knowledge are also culturally and socially determined. And that's why I think that we have that persistent problem in our education system, because some languages and some language repertoires and the fact that we mix languages are in some cases illegitimate or legitimate. Middle class language is the legitimate language to transfer and construct knowledge. Language, the language repertoire of the so-called blue collar has no legitimacy in our education systems. And I think that this is an important layer to add on the other layers we already had. The same for knowledge. Certain systems of knowledge construction, middle class systems of knowledge construction, have legitimacy. Other systems, other systems hardly have any uh, legitimacy. And that's why I think that the challenge lies more fundamentally into if we want to achieve that our languages are being respected, valued, shared and exploited. And that equity and social inequality and maximum lear learning opportunities can be realized for all children, a drastic shift is needed to a more inclusive diversity policy where language is part of it. It's about teachers' beliefs, how teachers notice or do not notice things. It about it is about 
as we, we were just, while we had the discussion, we, we, we talked about to what extent do I feel confident? My feeling of efficacy, it's about curricula, it's about didactics, it's about evaluation, it is about multilingualism and language of instruction which should be in the core of our um, curriculum and in our, in our educational systems, not as something separate, and it is about shared responsibility. Why teachers noticing? Because we know that in order to change teachers' practices, it begins with changing their views on their practices. His vision determines how one perceives the challenges and how one will address these. So a vision functions as a kind of lens on our practices. Teachers, we all have differential beliefs about educating students who differ from the so-called norm, the legitimate norm of which language, which repertoire we use, which system of knowledge uh, to deconstruct knowledge we use, and who have a higher risk of academic failure. These beliefs impact the way teachers create learning opportunities or do not create learning opportunities that appeal to the need of these students. So, it is about impacting students' cognitive and non-cognitive outcomes. The same for feelings of efficacy. They can mediate between our attitudes and our practices. Knowing, and here I'm, I'm, I'm addressing my two the, the teacher training colleges, knowing, and knowing that something is important is not the same as knowing how to implement it into practice. And there, I really think we still have a long way to go. For teachers, it is important that feeling of efficacy, of not having that feeling of efficacy. It's about quality of the classroom. It is about the teacher's well-being. It is about their motivation and commitment. But also in, red, in their relation to the pupils, seeing that something works with, with pupils, seeing that something works when, it, when we use, exploit these multilingual repertoires of the children, stimulates teacher self-efficacy. And it is also about the school. For those who are interested, I'm not going to discuss these, but we developed an instrument where we have seven dimensions where we try to measure and try to work with, with uh, teachers and schools with regard to what are teachers' attitudes and what are their feelings of efficacy. Good. And then the question, of course, is, is multilingual is efficient answer to inequities in education? We know that it has positive impacts for more than 140 years on metalinguistic awareness, on executive functioning, on cognitive, cognitive flexibility, uh, information uh, processing, etc. But we have to be careful in limiting ourselves to traditional bilingual education where we often see spatial and temporal separation arrangements and where we often see multitudes of languages but no interaction, nothing in the mainstream classroom. We also have to be aware of the fact that we often, when we talk about multilingualism, that we have a kind of a double standard. Some, some kind of multilingualism is seen as something positive, other kinds of multilingualisms are seen as, uh, as, as negative. And we know what the status languages are, or the perceived status languages, and what the non-status languages are. At the same time, we also have to be careful. I see a lot of fantastic and interesting activities with regard to multilingualism in education. However, they are, in my view, too much in the periphery. I, have to, I think when we talk about multilingualism, we have to go beyond the kumbaya multilingualism approach. Sorry for that. Also, in promoting multilingualism in education without taking into account the mechanisms of reproducing social inequality, there is a danger of multilingualism being an elitist instrument increasing inequity. Just let me give the example of Flanders' secondary education. What is, different, what is the difference with regard to the amount of foreign languages that students get in the higher tracks of, in, in the general tracks of education compared to the vocational tracks? I mean, we are, we are educating students in the general tracks who will become highly multilingual. And we strongly support the importance of being multilingual. Our students in the vocational tracks, highly any, highly anything on multilingual education. So, and that brings us to the, the concept which Kathleen already referred to, the functional multilingual learning. There's nothing fancy in it. It's actually very simple. It's the basic idea of me as a teacher, I don't have to do fancy things. I don't have to change my curriculum. I don't have to change my activities, my classroom. I don't have to change anything. It's about an attitude I take. It's about how can I, how can I as a teacher, exploit, not now and then, but on a daily basis, systematically, how can I exploit the, the multilingual repertoires of the children in order to construct knowledge, in order to support their learning 
strategies, their learning practices. So what I strongly advocate for here is that I think we need to integrate, and this is what, what Kathleen also does with translanguaging and transknowledging, we need to integrate everything we want to do with regard to multilingualism, the language of instruction and learning. We have to move beyond the binary discussion with regard to multilingualism and language of instruction or language of schooling. And this is for me an important condition in creating. So it's about a multilingual social interaction model for learning as an alternative for a language learning model. And so to conclude, as I said, I, I would like to, um, to, to um, address or to discuss with you our advocacy role. And that advocacy role is complex and we won't be able to play our role at each of these circles. But it is only by all of us taking up to the extent we can uh, take up our role, our advocacy role, in order to provide maximum opportunities for children to learn. It is about, and here I refer to Aristotle, it, it, it is about sharing, it's about knowledge, it, it is about epistemy, but it is also about technical knowledge, and it is also about practice, the promises. But that these dynamic interactions interact with how do we cooperate? How do teachers cooperate? Um, it's about communication but, um, within a school, between um, teachers and uh, principals, between principals across schools. It is about communication um, with policymakers and with politicians. It's also about professionalization, but it's also about these three circles where I refer to Spolsky. It's about the dynamics and how do we alter our beliefs in interaction with the management of multilingualism and language of, uh, of schooling and learning and our practices. Thank you very much.